Hello, Peter Four Seven Eight Nine Zero Cyrus here, and welcome to Cyrus Gaming Corn, a gaming podcast where I and Thor this week will talk about various gaming topics from old games to new games. Everything is fair game as far as game discussion goes. And for this week, Forrest is uh, still away on a business trip, so yeah. So how are uh, your evening going along, Sword? I'm doing pretty good. Always glad to be back on. Mm-hmm. Now, for today's episode, rather than talking about the topic that we were originally going to do, we're probably going to, like, the original plan was to talk about Tales of Rise, but we already talked about Zeo Saga in the series, the last... Uh, two episodes and last episode we talked about the model of soft RPGs well the model of soft two RPGs and one that's not an RPG but you get the point so we thought talking about Tales of Rise would sort of be uh, samey like redund- kind of redundant yeah. I guess yeah. mm. so for today's talk uh, we're going to expand on something we said previously on the New Year's episode. Or I think it was the New Year episode. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the topic is basically other genres that we play beside JRPGs. So, let's see. I guess the topic we should talk about is probably its counterpart, Western RPG. Yeah, yeah, I think we made one episode talking about it, but we can go yeah. into maybe like some more detail about it. Because honestly, it really is a whole beast of its own. Yeah. Are the various Western RPGs you played then? The sword. Uh, just going off the top of my head, I'm just gonna like come spitball in here. Like I played some of the Bethesda games, like Oblivion, Skyrim. I played Fallout Three, Four. I beat Dragon Age Origins. Played about half of Dragon Age Two. Didn't really like it that much. Mass Effect uh, series. I beat all of them plus Andromeda. I I don't know if this maybe counts as a Western RPG, but I think it has enough elements to consider it. But I did beat Horizon Zero Dawn. I think it has enough uh, RPG elements in it to classify it as one. Been forking myself through uh, Forbidden West, so those are the ones that. Um, I, oh yeah, um, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance One and Two. I beat as a kid. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, I, I played a good amount. There's probably some more that I just can't think off the top of my head, but yeah, I've, I've got a pretty beaten a good handful of them, I'd say. For me. In recent years, I haven't played much. Ten years back, I probably played a lot of Western RPGs. From mm-hmm. top of my head, I played uh, Fable. I think that counts as a Western RPG, right? Yeah, I yeah, think... yeah. I, I beat, yeah, I beat the, yeah. I beat the first two Fables. I think Fable One was like my first Western RPG. I think we said this mm-hmm. before. Uh, mm-hmm. Fable Two, beat Fable Three. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oblivion was my first Elder Scroll game, and then I played Skyrim. All the Mass Effect games except Andromeda. Uh, I haven't played for all the DLCs in Mass Effect. Uh, I played Dragon Age Origins, played for all the DLC there. Dragon Age 2, Dragon Age Inquisition. I'm probably gonna buy the next Dragon Age 4 whenever that comes out. I know it's announced, but for it. I know it comes out. But mm-hmm. good that, besides that, we don't have any more information on that, I think. Aside from it taking place in Tevinter, which is pretty interesting, given the mm-hmm. lore around uh, Tevinter. Um, yeah, aside from that, all we really know is that it's that it's going to exist. I played Fallout 1. Fallout 3 was my first Fallout game that I played. I played Fallout New Vegas uh, and beat it. I played a bit of Fallout 2, but I didn't beat it. I got, or I was, I was just at the starting area when you go through the temple area as the tutorial area. Does Dragon's Dogma count as a Western RPG? I'd say so. I think yeah, it's, yeah. I think there's enough RPG in there. Yeah. Uh, play through Dragon's Dogma, which was pretty good. Mm. Oh, yeah. I play Alpha Protocol, and be it. It's very jank, but I really like what I play through Alpha Protocol. I tried playing through Outer Worlds, but I didn't really got that far in it. I got to like the third or fourth planet, but that's all. Uh, I played two worlds. I didn't play for much of it. Hated it. I, remember I played the demo when I was a kid. And I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Even even high school version of me was smart enough to know that it was bad. 
That's all the Western RPGs I can think of the top of my head. Yeah, so, like I said, they're they're pretty much a different beast of their own, honestly, compared to JRPGs. Like like I said previously on the Western RPG uh, episode, I think the main appeal of most Western RPGs is player choice in terms of how you can affect the narrative in some ways, but mostly how you interact like character relationships through player interaction. Whereas like JRPGs are a lot more about a more of a linear story yeah. and less much less about choice and and uh, also in western rpgs there's also a lot of emphasis on like and most of the time you create your own player character yeah. like nine times out of ten mm -hmm. but yeah there's like a lot of emphasis on training your own character leveling them up the way you want and doing different builds in a western rpg i feel yeah I like depending that... on the on the no go ahead yeah, I think that's like where the main appeal is in a Western RPG. Is yeah, like, like I feel like in a, a lot of the times, like if you were to compare like your character to my character in, in such and such RP, Western RPG, like it, we'd be very different. Yeah. Because there's a lot, it's a lot more open net. They tend to be mm -hmm. a lot more open net in most of the time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything more we can add that we didn't already said in the Western RPG episode? Uh, I'm not. Not particularly. I feel like we'll yeah. just kind of be repeating the same points, but yeah. it was at least worth bringing up just for the yeah. sake of the video, you know? Yeah. So I, I guess to the people watching this, if you want to know more of our thoughts, just go watch that episode. Yeah. <laughs> we cover pretty much everything you yeah. need to know. Uh, I guess uh, we should talk with other genres. You know what's a genre that's the most vague? What's that? Action and adventure. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Like, <laughs> that one's, sometimes that can be hard to pinpoint exactly, like, what even, yeah. like, it's a, kind of like an umbrella term when you think mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. I guess we could talk about hack and slash games. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's two categories of hack and slash games we can go on about. The character action hack and slash games, like, um... The Devil May Cry and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. The guy in Bayonetta, that kind of thing. And the Dynasty Warriors. It's yeah, it's a whole other beast. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> I do find it really interesting how do those are like the two categories of act of like hack and slash games you can go into nowadays. And it's funny because even though they're both like technically hack and slash, they're both like they almost feel like different genres when you put yeah. them back to back too. Because Devil May Cry is a lot like about style, and and they have like very sophisticated move sets, and requires like, like a lot Devil, of skill to master. Like the character action games, it's all about like player expression, in mm. um, terms of how you execute your combos. Like it varies in terms of in terms of the action game. Like Devil May Cry and Ninja Gaiden, they're like are both character action games, but they have a different emphasis on uh, various ways you want to play the game. With Ninja Guy, you want to be much more methodical, but then you still still have some freedom of how you want to play through the game, just through the various weapon types. Why in Devil May Cry, it's all about player expression because there's so many different type of combos you can do, just because of how the game uses its moveset, where Ninja Guy is much more traditional way to use combos because it's just a combination of square uh, uh, standard and heavy attacks and then you just use the moves that are the most optimal for a certain situation while in Devil May Cry uh, you have a lot more moves to play around with due to how each move is executed not for uh, button combinations but through like certain inputs the Devil May Cry, when you get down to it, has a much more free flow, free flowing uh, combo system. While Ninja Gaiden is much more strict, much more static. With, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like Devil May Cry is kind of a lot, a lot more, like more free form in a way. Mm -hmm. Now I haven't played a Ninja Gaiden game myself, but I do know based on like what I've heard from other people that that's pretty much like how it is. It's mm -hmm. more like um, strict with how you got to fight. Whereas, like, I haven't beaten every Devil May Cry game myself, but the ones I did beat, well, except for Devil May Cry 2, uh, the, the other ones require, like, very sophisticated um, movesets and, and, uh, and, and thinking, like, you know, that kind of thing. Devil May Cry have... 2, you just, gotta, you just gotta press square to win. 
And then you have the other, other side of the spectrum where it's Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors or Dynasty Warrior Gundam or, or <laughs> Fire Emblem Warriors, that sort of stuff. Where it really is pretty much just, you know, hammering one button for the most part and destroying mm -hmm. armies with one guy. <laughs> I would say for the most part, like the emphasis is on feeling like a one man army in the game. But I wouldn't say it's brainless in the way that, uh, like, you do need to be able to manage uh, how you move through the battlefield in Dicey Warriors and Samurai Warriors and Fireman Warriors yeah. to a certain degree. Cause, it's like, not like 100% shut your brain off or anything. Because, like, you know what's most of the difficulty? Uh, in at least like the earlier Dice Warrior games and in, in Warrior games in general, it's managing your uh, ally units in a way that they don't kill themselves. Yeah. And I think Dicey Warriors um, works that way since you still feel like a one man army in terms of how you're plowing down through enemies, but you still have to pay attention where you have to go. And where how you interact with uh, uh, with the battlefield in terms of how the enemy uh, troops are moving and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, compared to like a character action game, the, the strategy kind of comes from outside combat in a lot of ways, yeah. where you gotta like be more conscientious of the, I guess like your surroundings and and the mm -hmm. and the level design and things like that. Yeah. Which you know, which is which is interesting in its own right. Yeah. I think it's really a matter of preference. And I feel like every, like, warrior game has tried to do something unique in terms of how it does, like, the fuel system. At least that's how I feel. I haven't played most of the warrior games, so I might be wrong on that. But just from the ones I've played. Yeah, and I'm I, just kind of I haven't played any since I was a kid, so... And I think the, like, crossover warriors game is really interesting in terms of how they managed to implement the Warriors gameplay in such a way that feels very in line with uh, the series itself. Like I think the game that comes to mind that we can both talk about uh, is Persona 5 Strikers. Yeah. That game feels much more like a Persona game than it does a Dynasty Warrior game. I, you know what? It's kind of a weird comparison, but I feel like it's almost reminiscent of Final Fantasy VII Remake in that it really blends, like, kind of art turn-based RPG combat with, like, action. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of menu surfing. There's a lot uh, of thought that needs to put into your actions. Mm -hmm. And, it, yeah, it, like, it literally feels like a, a true Persona action RPG combat system. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of, like, you're pausing the game, summoning your persona, looking at weaknesses, doing all that stuff, like, thinking about enemy uh, defense bars and things like that. There's, actually, it's surprisingly uh, fairly in-depth. Not like, it's not, like, um, too, too complicated, but there's a good amount going on where you actually gotta um, consider, you know, you can't just mindless, brainlessly mash the attack button. Uh, but, yeah, that's very, the hack slash game genre in a nutshell, I think. Overall, even though there's like two different types, I think like we still really like them just because of the action that you get from it and the feeling. Yeah, like uh, feeling like a badass. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing like combos are cool. Combos are cool, and doing they are. <laughs> They're fun to pull off. And doing combos in either character action game or dice order game are cool. Unless you're Devil May Cry too. <laughs> well, yeah, you just. <laughs> You're just a shooting game at that point. Basically. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, I guess we should talk about shooting games then, I guess. So, do you play those? Yeah. I, I have very little exposure. I got a couple under my belt. Like, I beat both of the Last of Us games. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, guess I, I, I mean, does Mass Effect count? Let me let me try to differentiate. Do you play more first person or third person shooter games, do you think? Uh, between the two, definitely third person. Oh, okay. Do you think you uh, like the different perspective matters in terms of how you play, like in terms of your enjoyment of the game? 
It's you know what's weird because I, de- I I'm trying to think of like I don't really have a reason per se. I guess I just feel less engaged when it's just a generic first person view. I guess like mm-hmm. I feel like I'm not as in like invo- invested if I'm j- if I can't see my character. I, I I don't know if that makes any sense to people watching, but it's just for some reason I don't feel as engaged in the experience if it's just first person. That's I really, guess I, I really guess the it's only mostly. Way. I guess it's mostly because if you view, like, playing the game as your own, like yourself, or playing the game as the character in the game. I think. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. because we mostly play J- JRPGs, we're mostly more more used to playing, getting played in the role of an actual character in the game. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it boils down to just my, yeah. you know, being more exposed to other genres outside yeah. of that. That I first persons are hard to you know get into i think that's mostly like like most people say like the more immersed in first person because they feel like themselves but mm-hmm. for the most part i don't feel like i'm playing myself in most video games i'm playing yeah like, even like if it's a a, cell, a player created self insert character yeah. i feel like it's it's not me i feel like it's just a robot that i'm commanding yeah even in like dragon mm-hmm. age game when I'm playing, creating a character, I'm usually playing a particular archetype that I'm going to play for that type. Mm-hmm. Be, it is an archetype that I think uh, that meshes well with me for my first playthrough. It's still an archetype. Um, but for me, like I don't mind either first person or third person perspective. Yeah, it's just, like I said, I think it's literally boils down to just preference yeah. and that's really about it. Not, not that one's inherently better or worse than the other. Though I will say there are some differences in how you interact with it that can make first or third person shooter more engaging or less engaging. Mm-hmm. I think one aspect of third person shooter that can make combat feel a less engaging is probably the cover system. If a shooting game is yeah. a cover system. <laughs> like depending on how it's implemented, yeah. it could be like not it could be good or bad, you know. Strangely enough, like I th- Killzone Two had a cover system sort, but I didn't feel if um, took the gameplay away as much as third person shooter. Mostly because like in f- while you're doing uh, taking cover in Killzone Two, you can't see the enemy because it's in first person, so you still have to make an active effort in like in finding an enemy why you're why you're out of cover. The cover systems and third person shooters you're you're just waiting and you already know where you're going to fire your weapon because it's you, you can see them even if your character's in cover because you're you're fire fighting in third person shooter aspect what i will say though is like i think third person shooter has some more interesting uh, like they go out have more there's some various more interesting mechanics just because it is in third person it's like there are some third person shooters that have like v- some very interesting ways of how you interact with the game. You know what Red Faction is? I've heard of it, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know much about it though. Yeah, like I played Red Faction Gorilla. I think that that's a really interesting third person shooter game because you're like just so much destruction, destructibility in it. And I don't think that like that game like that would work in first person shooter in terms of the amount of destruction you can do with it in terms of like like i know the like, the battlefield games have like destructible environments but i don't think it's to the extent of rack fresh and gorilla yeah like I, f- of- I feel like um i feel like third person shooters you know, have kind of some inherent um not advantages per se but elements yeah. that first person shooters aren't able to have just because of the way that they're you know designed I, ju- I think they just like, like just the pers- just the fact they're in third p- person perspective, makes it easier to convey some games more, some other genres better. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I, I think, think that's probably. A re- I think Uncharted is a prime example of uh, how that game I don't think would work. The main point in the Uncharted games is to feel basically like. Indiana Jones, basically, I think. That's literally what it is, for sure. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of that that personality to it would mm-hmm. be lost if it was first person. 
Because Uncharted is all about like awesome set pieces and things like that, and it wouldn't translate well if it was yeah. the other way around. Or like talk. Last of Us also, I think, works better yeah. in third person than it would in first yeah, person. Yeah, because that because you're mostly playing as Joel in mm -hmm. Last of Us 1. Or um, Abby and um, Ellie in mm -hmm. uh, Last of Us 2. Why most third, first person shooters like work in terms of into making yourself feel like you're the character, I think. Yeah, yeah, basically. But I think what's interesting about Last of Us, though, is that it also has a lot of... Um, it's not just going guns blazing. It's You also got to be... Like, when you go into encounters, usually you're going to want to try to stealth enemies at first. Mm -hmm. Chances are you're going to get caught at some point a lot of the time because an enemy's like your blind spot and you can't see them. Mm -hmm. But it's... Like, Last of Us, both of them aren't just, you know... You know, whole, being all trigger happy. It's actually there's actually some like con like thought you got to put into your how you go about encounters and stuff like that, which I appreciate about Last of Us. I'm I'm really into horror games. I don't okay. know if you've uh, have any. I haven't played much horror games, but you can take the floor on horror games. Uh, so I definitely think my introduction to horror was with the Silent Hill series. I feel like that's that's kind of a lot of people's gateway into into horror. That and or Resident Evil. So my my exposure to Silent Hill was back like in middle school ish I want to say and then uh, my dad bought Silent Hill too, and you know as a kid I, like I was like the biggest chicken shit as a kid I couldn't even watch a horror movie without losing sleep so Silent Hill was the game that I never thought I'd really play much, and then the years go by and eventually we eventually got Silent Hill three and then I don't know what possessed me to do it but I eventually picked it up and played that game all the way through myself, and honestly that that one experience was really interesting to me because I never really played anything like it and i eventually played a bunch of other Silent hill games i beat two three four which is Silent Hill for the room uh origins and homecoming i beat all those um i recently beat um a newer horror game called the medium which i really enjoyed um and <laughs> we we both unfortunately played raccoon city <laughs> but does we that, tried to block that, that from our mind does that really count as horror <laughs> I mean, it's kind of grasping at straws. I mean, I only say that because it kind of comes from, it has horror roots, but yeah, it's kind of a split hairs, but um, yeah, I think what I like about um, horror games, um, depend or like it really depends on the horror game we're talking about, but is the fact that because it's like as dark as it is, it kind of has that privilege of being able to explore topics that other genres of games just aren't willing to, to delve into. Like, like, how, how are you familiar with Silent Hill 2 at all? The story in that game at all? No, I know bits of it, but I haven't played through it. Okay, all right, so for, for, for the sake of that, I won't go into details, but like that game in particular deals with things like um, like sexual abuse, bullying, suicide. Um, it has all these like very, very disturbing topics that I, I feel like other games just would not even, uh, waters that wouldn't they wouldn't even try to tread. And um, they they're able to explore these themes, you know, that are that are considered taboo a lot of the times. And I just and a lot of the times I also really uh, like psychological horror. Like I, I'm not I feel like I speak for a lot of horror people when I say that like I'm not a fan of jump scares. I feel like a jump scare here and there can be effective, but if your horror game or movie relies exclusively on that, then it's it's a bad horror experience, just by far, bar none. I think. And, um, I think horror games are interesting in that. Most of the fun in most other genres is having like various options and having freedom to execute those options in a way that's interesting. But in horror games, is like you're limiting the options so you can like invoke a certain type of emotion within said horror game in terms of feeling like you're screwed or you're isolated and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an advantage. Like I feel like um that feeling of vulnerability. And you got to have that kind of fight or flight instinct where it's like, do I want to engage this this hideous monster that's trying to kill me with this uh, metal pipe that I just picked up? Or do I want to use one of my one of my three bullets to kill it? Or do I want to just try to run away? You know, you have that um, you have you have that option. And it's also like a lot about resource management and things like that, where, you know, Ammo is scarce. Healing items are scarce. You shouldn't fight everything you come across, really. If you you know try to avoid them, if you can, like um, 
no, like like Silent Hill is really good with that. Depending on the difficulty you play, um, healing items and ammo will be more or less scarce depending on what you're playing on. But even on the easiest one, you can't just you know pick up uh, ammo and just blow everything away with your shotgun. You know you got to actually think about it a little bit. Um, I, I'm not a fan of horror games where the only thing you can do is run and hide. I, I honestly don't always find I don't find that to be scary per se I, I don't find like oh look there's this thing coming after me i have to run and hide in a locker for five minutes because i um one of the things of horror games that i like is that feeling of uncertainty like you'll you'll have an option like do i fight it okay that killed me so i probably shouldn't fight it should i run away oh it's too fast um whereas if i'm playing a game where the only option is to run and hide i'm doing exactly what the game wants me to do i know that once i run and hide in a locker or under a bed or something i'm gonna um Get, I'm gonna escape the enemy 100% of the time because the game is built around that. I like having the option. I I, I, li I don't like I don't feel like being defenseless is always uh, an effective um, method of conveying uh, fear in the player. So I, I, having those options and also so having what, very so what, clunky so, combat. So what you're saying is you don't like Outlast. I haven't played it, and because of that, I probably won't. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, another, like Silent Hill is another good example of having with the combat, it's very clunky, but by design, it's it's not mm -hmm. it's not meant to be this high octane action game. It's you're like the characters you they they emphasize that the characters you're playing as are civilians with no combat experience. So James has no combat experience. Heather is a 17 year old girl. Obviously, she's not gonna have combat experience. Things like that. So the combat is intentionally awkward, but it's not like broken or unplayable. It's just intended to be like. Um, kind of a, a form of like a, like a last resort basically um and uh yeah and uh and another thing about horror games i love is like atmosphere i love being in like dilapidated buildings or uh you know old construction sites with blood caked on the walls and things like that depending on how it's done or having ambient really creepy ambient noise and um all that does all that put together effectively creates a really memorable experience too so I mean that's that's pretty much what I can think about horror games, honestly, uh, off the top of my head, in terms of like what I like about them. How about horror visual novels? I don't think I've played any, but I that is something that I would be willing to try. Like I actually own Doki Doki Literature Club, <laughs> and which I hear some um, some things about. Like I played various of. Uh, horror visual novels, I guess. Tsukihime you can count as one, I think. Sort of. Uh, 999, I think, counts. Hmm. And, uh, like, I think that they work really well as stories. Because, like, I think 999 especially works as a video game. Just because of how it integrates its story in a way that it makes playing it make sense. Like it, 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 it's not like anything dumb like in the where it's like oh it's it's all a video game all along no no it just executed in a way where only like playing it in the original DS like makes it flow so much better than the re-release even though the re-release on the P on current consoles and PC has high resolution voice acting like the like you can tell like nine 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 like three nines was like uh designed around the dual screens of um the ds and i guess we should just talk about visual novels i think visual novels are like an interesting topic in terms of discussing if they are video games or not yeah i do have some exposure to that so yeah. that's, that's something i could talk about yeah like i do think they do count as video games since they do require interaction from you in some of the other visual novels, that interaction is key in getting the full story. Because like, take Fate Stay Night. Fate Stay Night overall is like technically three stories, but it's three stories that requires the playthrough of one route in order to get the other route. And I think it's done in a way that even though there are three stories, it does feel like you're getting, uh, you're understanding the raw grand story they face say night of who these characters are, why they're making the choices they do. And I think that's not something that can really work in uh, like an anime form. 
or movie form. Just because like in a video game, you you can be expected to replay the game various times to get the true ending. Since you're playing through it and you have interaction through how fast you go through the content. But you don't really have that much freedom in, in like a medium like anime or like in a movie. Yeah, yeah. And plus, depending on the visual novel, there's actually like sometimes a degree of failure, like where it's yeah. you get like a bad ending or something and you say, oh, I didn't want that. And you got to go back because mm -hmm. that that's also that's also like something of a video game would do. You get a game over because you're out against the boss or something like that. I do think so. like even the bad endings have value just because they put the character in a situation where you learn more about the, why they failed this way. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I think of it. Yeah, right. yeah, and plus, like you said, it's it's the, that interactivity inherently makes yeah. it a, a video game. It's you know, it's not, this isn't a book where it's just you 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 read it mm -hmm. as is. There is some semblance of player choice in, involved, yeah. even if even no matter how minimal it might be, depending on the visual novel in question, it's still there. I do think visual novels does them having voice acting and um, music does help in immersing you into the story more. I think. And again, you'd feel the emotions more. Yeah, between like, you got like character portraits, yeah. you got background images and things like that. Like it's, you know, and like, like you said, music, I think voice acting. novels is like a final fusion between like a book and anime or movies. Just because like in visual novels, you have like, you'd be able to read the character's monologue and see what they're thinking and have much more detail in what's happening around in the world in Vision of, as you probably won't be able to get that much detail in an anime or movie. Also, unlike in a book, you have music, uh, voice acting, visuals, to help you like visualize the content more, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that really works in most genres. Like the only f portion where it's iffy is like in horror vision novels, where maybe the horror does come from you not knowing how it looks. But even then, I think the good horror vision novels makes it that you don't really see the the undescribable horror. Like they usually only have you look at the screen and reading what's happening. You don't actually yeah, see. Yeah, you just gotta use your imagination. Yeah. That's where the good horror vision novels do the things like a book can, I think. Yeah, like, um, this technically isn't a visual novel, it's an RPG, but uh, roughly 70% of the game is a visual novel, so I'm just gonna yeah. count it anyway. Is, um, is Death and Request? Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I think you and Forrest was talking about it before. Yeah, it's, it's basically a visual novel rpg hybrid and it takes mm -hmm. the game takes place in an mmo like dot hack basically mm -hmm. and it's called death and request because the choices you make will sometimes lead to a bad ending and they call them death ends in the game mm -hmm. and a lot of them are absolutely gruesome and the, the 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 descriptive details they give you even if you can't see it they live little leave little to the imagination mm -hmm. like there is a part where um there's a death end where all of your party members are literally melted by lava and you can hear the screams like the horrific screams of them and then and the, the way they fucking just describe like the the flesh coming off and shit like it's absolutely disgusting and it's that's a that's like an example of um the the fact that a visual novel is able to convey things just from how yeah. it's like written yeah i think like the visual novel strength is its story but it's done mm -hmm. in a way that i think like it won't be possible in like in a book or um in an anime or movie just because of the interactive interactivity you have with it and like i think like in a visual novel like a story can seem even more grand through the use of how you have different routes and how you can how you need to play for other routes to get the full story rather than just yes. a, a single story in an anime or movie where, or even in a book, where you only have one path. And then, like, once you read it or watch it, yeah. and it's it's done, and that's it. It's, yeah. Everyone's going to have this same experience. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting, because you can see the character interact in different ways. Since there are, like, different paths and routes you can you can see them do. Why in the store, in a linear story, uh, like, you can, uh, like, theorize how they would act, but that's mostly all. You don't have as much... Um, Let's see, what's the word for it? 
Uh, like freedom? Yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's something like that. Yeah. No, I just think like most visual novels that have like different multiple routes are interesting in that way, just because that like, you can see characters interact in different ways and how they how one route can differ so much from another route just because of. Uh, of how characters behave differently due to the choice the main character uh, makes. Mm -hmm. Like that, I think that's a good example of when we were talking about mm -hmm. Western RPGs before. Yeah. Like, what visual novels do, what they don't, is the sense that I feel like I am the character in that game. Mm -hmm. like, I feel like I actually am the one involved in the story. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't feel like it's a robot that I'm commanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, but yeah, I think. Like, in terms of story, I think, like, the visual novels is, again, like I said, the my, my main appeal. But story done in a way that's unique to video games, though. Which is why I still say visual novels are video games. They tell a story in the game that only a visual novel can tell, really. Yeah, like, if it was a, a book or an anime, like you, like you said, it just wouldn't work as well. Could Because, especially if it's, like, a very branching visual novel, yeah. like, if it's an anime adaptation, they have to pick that's, one that's, route to stick that, to that, it. That's why there's no way we'll ever get, like, a perfect rendition of Face Stay Night in anime mm -hmm. form. Yeah, because, I mean, aside from we have now, because now we have different adaptations of each route. Yeah. And even though they're really, they're all, they're all well done in their own ways, but it doesn't have that, um same sense of interactivity yeah. as as a visual novel would because like, yeah. if you want to only watch the anime you have the the 2006 fate state night which is just the fate route just all the way through you got the ufotable unlimited blade works and you got heaven's feel you just got to watch them all back to back if you're not going to read the visual yeah. novel which it sucks because like the visual novel is not easily accessible and uh, it works so. better it works better in a visual novel because because you can skip through parts you've already read before why in um in anime, not so much unless you know like ahead of time which episodes to skip or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you're see. stuck just rewatching content, you know. Yeah. You'd just be like watching on this eight in a. Uh, in Hari. Hari Suzuki. Oh God, <laughs> never again. Uh, is there any other genre we should talk about? Um. There isn't any others really that I can think of that I, mm -hmm. I'm into off the top of my head. Oh, wait, I know. Hmm. Open world games. <laughs> oh boy, I got some things to say oh, about boy. that. <laughs> so, let's see. I would say I play a fair share of open world games. I played Assassin's Creed from 1 to Black Flag, where which is a lot. Which is a lot of Assassin's Creed when you get down to it. I played Ghost of Tsushima. I played Horizon Zero Dawn, the first one, and I've played a bit of Forbidden West. And like, oh, I played Far Cry 2 and 3. And that's all in terms of the Far Cry games. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what other open world games I've played? Uh, Elden Ring, I guess you can count. I, th I would say I would say not all of them, but specifically Xenoblade Chronicles X. I would say classifies probably as an open yeah. world game because it's a lot more. F it's not as um, linear as Xenoblade One and Two. Yeah, I haven't but played Xenoblade Chronicle X, so I wouldn't know. Oh, okay, gotcha. I played the Saboteur back on the PS3. Okay, how are you? Um... I mean, I, the only ones I can think of is I, there's the Bethesda games that I mentioned before. Also, like I said, Horizon Zero Dawn. I did play not all of it, but I played a, a fairly decent amount of Ghost of Tsushima. I played a decent amount of Xenoblade X. Not all of it, but, you know, a good amount. Um, there's there's probably some others I'm th that I, I did that I can't remember. But on, it's, you know, th that's just the ones that come off the top of my head, really. Final Fantasy 15, does that count? I, I'd say that counts. Yeah, that counts. This really, yeah. like, most of the open world is available from the get-go, I think. Mm -hmm, yeah, because, like, I, like, the reason I say I don't count Xenoblade 1 and 2 is because even though the environments are big, you're still limited to where like, you go there, in the story. There's, like, like, there's, like, there's an error progression in yeah, the, yeah. the game. Like, you're always going to start off in Colony 9, then go to Tefra Cave, then go to Gower Plain. Like, and it's it's how it's going to be. Like, there's there's a lot to do in them, but it's it's mm -hmm. it's more linear. Whereas Final Fantasy 15, it's like the whole world is open to you pretty much from the start, really. Yeah. So I yeah, I I'd throw that in there. 
Yakuza? Um, yeah, 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 it's in its own way. Yakuza and... Uh, and Gra Judgment? Yeah. Judgment? And GTA, I guess, counts too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, I feel like as long as the story doesn't restrict you where you can go... Like, mm -hmm. I, like for, I, I get for certain parts, like, oh, some urgent is happening here and you gotta go here, whatever. I'm talking, like, in terms of progression, where it's like, if, it, if yeah. the open world is open to you from pretty much the start... Then I I throw that in there. Whereas like guess, yeah, so like Yakuza is a good example of that. How about yeah, I guess that counts for some Yakuza, but not for other Yakuza games. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's kind of a case by case yeah. basis in a way. Because like there's some Yakuza games where you can only go to a certain area when you're playing as certain characters. Mm -hmm. Or even Yakuza Seven, where like you know like most of it takes place in in Jincho. Where you where you don't even go back to Komorocho until like the the end of the the end of the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Lost Judgment, you're for the most part you're able to go back to Komorocho and Ijin Show like, yeah, kind of at your own leisure, except with some only some exceptions. Mm -hmm. You say you have some thoughts on open world games? <laughs> yeah, I got some stuff to say. Uh, I feel like um, uh, so here's my thing. I feel like when people make op a lot of developers make open world games, they have a uh, this mindset where it's bigger is better. The bigger the open field, the better it is, regardless of if there's a lot of content or not. As long as it's big, and as long as it takes forever to get to somewhere, it's a good open world game. And a lot of the a lot oftentimes like side quests will just boil down to busy work. It's needle and haystack stuff. Like Final Fantasy 15 is one of the worst defenders of this, where it's oh go find these dog tags and come back. Go go do this gigantic ass area that we highlighted on your map and find this tiny ass dog tag that you're never gonna fucking see and come back to me. And then um, a lot of the times in open world games, the areas feel so empty most of the time. You know, and, and the the closest thing you'll have is some stuff to pick up, and a sh the stray monster every you know every now and then. Whereas, it, um, I think a good example is in Xenoblade Chronicles X. That's how it's done, right? Where it's um the there's a lot of wildlife and they're all interacting with each other, and the world feels alive and organic. That's a really well done open world game. Whereas something like Final Fantasy 15 just just doesn't cut it. And I do I actually do like the design of Ghost of Tsushima's world. I feel like sometimes there is a little bit, a bit too much running off my taste, but I like the art style and there is enough going on to where it's where it feels fun to do. And in that game, the side quests often are like actually little mini stories in themselves, uh, which which I appreciate. And that's the other thing about a lot of open world games that they boil down to is side quests are just kill quests or fetch quests. Now you know we could talk about like the the, con the the glitches and stuff of bethesda games but in games like oblivion and skyrim regardless of the quality at the end of the day almost all the side quests in this game in those games are little mini stories of of themselves and g it gives me more incentive to want to do them whereas if it's something like final Fantasy 15 or or you know whatever uh it's it gets monotonous and and boring and it gets to a point where i just don't want to do it anymore and i just move on with the story and i oh. have we mentioned yakuza oh no go mm -hmm. ahead yeah, I would say most the problem with open world games nowadays, like the way you traverse through the games, are can be boring at times just because it's just you're just walking around. Mm -hmm. There's like three games off the top of my head where I think traversing is interesting. One is Breath of the Wild. Mm. Two, Gravity Rush. And three, Elden Ring. Uh, those are the three games where I think traversing is the most interesting. And Elden Ring, just because it's like, it's typical, like, the way how you progress through it is typical Dark Souls. But typical Dark Souls and how you progress is interesting in terms of, like, it's not really straightforward in terms, like, you, like in Elden Ring, it's even interesting how, how you get the map. Just because, like, it doesn't have any, like, usual waymarks. You have to go through each area, go to, like, uh... Uh, totem that will give you a map and even on the map there's no like air like comparing the map between Horizon Zero Dawn and Elden Ring is interesting because on like when I first played Forbidden West once you unlock a map there's all these different icons that like interactable icons on map you can interact with and then and if you press on it it gives you compass it's not like that in Elden Ring where you do unlock it um 
it just gives you an ordinary map where you can see landmarks, but you have to you have to like interact with the map in a way where you want to go to that landmark yourself and place markers on it. Yeah, you like as much as I, I like the Horizon games. Yeah, the the maps give too much away to the point yeah. where when you're walking around, you know exactly where you're going to encounter and when and, and where it is. And just traveling around is interesting, just because Torrent is pretty cool, because it's a horse that can double jump. And you have some more mm -hmm. interesting conventions, conventional ways you can travel through the game. But also because like the area progression in Elden Ring and the Souls game is really interesting in a way that you, it's not really straightforward. You do have to explore uh, the area to a forest in order to get to the area that you're aiming for. Because like most open world games are very straightforward in how you get to it. Not so much at Elder Ring in terms of where you of how you want to get to this specific area. You, you might have to take a, a detour to go to a path that will get you towards this uh, cavern that's like on top of you or beneath you. Mm. And in Gravity Rush, it's interesting because of the way how Cat travels with gravity power. I think. And just the world, yeah. and just how the world is designed. With gravity powers in mind is interesting too. Yeah, like I think methods of traversal are a big yeah. thing too. Whereas if it's yeah. just running around, yeah. then it gets boring. And Breath of the Wild is interesting just because there's like you can scale everything, but you still have to be smart in how you scale it because there's a stamina system. And mm -hmm. if you run out of stamina while climbing, you're basically dead. But yeah, I think like like those three games does traversal in a way that's interesting. Where, while in other open world games, traversing isn't really all that interesting. Yeah, like, to bring it up one more time, like, even though, uh, uh, some about Horizon that I do like is, even though the map, I feel like, I agree, like, gives too much away, is what makes it still fun is just the design of the world because like you know that game has such interesting lore and you have like robotic animals walk inhabiting in the world and they're always fun to encounter and stuff like that so it has its own unique kind of like atmosphere to it that still yeah. makes it fun to explore but like the, the traversal is interesting in most other open world games what makes yeah. them interesting is a byproduct of fighting things along the way i think mm-hmm and, th and that's the thing about Horizon that works in its favor is that the machines that you encounter are so different from one another and, and just seeing them, seeing these robotic animals interact with environments as if they were the real animals that they look like, it's so creepy and surreal and I think that that's something that makes it and the exploration enjoyable it are the machines that you fight along the mm -hmm. way too. But yeah, I think most open world games suffer just because of how straightforward uh, exploration is in the game because like it's big but there's not really much depth to it, just because of how straightforward it is to get to most areas. Mm -hmm. Now, it, like it most worked, of the time, it, it worked in some games because like exploration isn't the main point. In uh, some open world games, like in Yakuza, it's not trying to make it that you have to explore this te this city. It's just to convey that this is an actual city with people in it, and there's lots of content you can go through it. And, like, and that's why I point, think Yakuza the main point mm -hmm. is is in the in story progression and and doing all these different stories that revolve around in the city. And, and that's why I think Yakuza works so well as open world is even though the cities you explore aren't terribly big, they are absolutely rich with content. Mm -hmm. So it's not about just exploring a big map just for the sake of it. They're mm -hmm. like you'll walk around to the city and you can't go two steps without something happening. And there's always something different. Like, you have all these really crazy uh, side stories, and they're really fun to do, and you could in engage in all these mini-games if you want, and, you know, despite, like, the cities like Kamurocho or Jincho, I mean, they're they're big enough, like, they still feel like big living cities, but they're not gigantic-ass, you know, open, like, an actual open-world game or anything like that, but they are so rich with content that you can, despite them not being that big you can still play them for literally dozens of hours and you'll you'll always enjoy it because there's always something different going on and that's why i think yakuza is more about like quality over quantity mm -hmm. anything else to add about open world games i don't i don't think so to be honest oh uh, i guess uh, one more thing how do you think about genres just adopting a leveling system because that's like, just, like 
just for the sake of it. Yeah. Uh, it really depends because there are times where I feel like it's shoehorned in there just just yeah. because they have it. I don't know why it's become so trendy, mm. but I will say that if you have a game that has that like is either has a good amount of ta- you know it's it's a fairly long game or something like that, and there's a lot of combat, I do think that having some kind of progression system to keep like the variety is is helpful in a way mm-hmm. like maybe expanding your move set or things like that but if i i don't think that we need every single game like we don't need a grand theft auto or something with a fucking skill tree in it that is not yeah. necessary like we we don't need a skill tree a leveling system in every single thing like 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 before you know it there'll be a a silent hill game with leveling uh, with a skill tree in it you know what i mean it's just mm-hmm it's become it's like it's become so trendy and i feel like there's a lot of game developers that put them in there just because they feel like they have to yep how about you how do you feel about it i do feel like just putting in a leveling system by itself feels very cheap in terms of of, uh, accomplishing that level of progression Mm. like just just a leveling system just a straight up uh, here level up stat increase and there we're done yeah <laughs> there's no depth to it whatsoever yeah. I, I think it'd be hypocritical of me saying i don't like the level systems given that i play a lot of our jrpgs and western rpgs but i think it works in those games just because those games are built with our level system in mind not only in terms of like they have interesting ways of how you use your experience through various leveling through various customization options like even the straightforward ones allows you to learn more skills and abilities through leveling up which increases your combat repertoire just adding a leveling system by itself i don't think is really all that interesting yeah it's basically it's, it's like just, mm-hmm. like um uh, uh have you ever played like evil within yeah it's kind of, something like kind of like that too they kind of do like a similar deal yeah So it just when when it when it feels like shoehorned in where it's like oh yeah let's let's uh, let's throw in some experience points system in there and just for the sake of it there you go then it ends up just feeling really shallow and not rewarding like it should be. Yeah. But yeah, that's my thoughts on it. If they can implement it in a way that makes it feel like to make it feel like you are progressing stronger, then not only through stats but also various abilities you can learn or unlocking various mechanics that you didn't before for progressing for the game either for leveling i think that works but just uh just leveling system by itself i don't i think i can feel like very few born in i feel pretty cheap in terms of getting that feeling of progression you see found in most rpgs um i think a good example of a game that's not an rpg that has some elements in it is i did mention it before but it's actually also last of us because the way they handle it is with the different supplements that you find it encourages exploration for one and you're you're rewarded for going off the beaten path and, and looking looking at every nook and cranny and the upgrades that you get feel substantial too like increasing health reducing the weapon sway when you're aiming a gun or you know um reducing crafting or uh, yeah increasing crafting speed things like that it's it's not so rpg to, you know it's it's not so much to the point where it feels shoehorned in it actually feels rewarding and i think that's an example of how to do how to do it right it, it doesn't have a level up system but it's an rpg like skill system in its own right and I, I think they did a pretty good job with it yeah i think that's all really Mm-hmm. i think that's all the genre we play mostly that's off the top of the head at least yeah, I don't really have anything left yeah. to cover, to be honest. Overall, um, even though like we do primarily play JRPGs, I do think uh, we do like other genres we play from time to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah, I'll, I'll, RPGs will always be my favorite, but mm-hmm. there are other ones that I delve into mm-hmm. every now and then that I think are fun to go back to. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's all for today. I, I think next week we will talk about Tales of Arise. Well, not, not next yeah. week. Ne- next time. Next time yeah, we will yeah. talk about Tales of Arise. Yeah, just just figure we break it up with the, yeah. the genres. Because we talk about RPGs all the time, so figure yeah. might as well do something a little different, okay. you know. So, But yeah, this is Peter4790, Sasaris, signing off. Take care, everyone.